this installment of the uh, major spotlight lecture series. Um, I'm Dr. Brent Hendrickson. I'm a professor and the chair of the biology department here at Millsaps College. And um, I'm really excited uh, to be here tonight to, to have the opportunity to share my passions um, and my research with you. Uh, but before we do that, um, I do need to address a little bit of an elephant in the room. And uh, particularly if there's any alumni that have worked with me in the past, you probably noticed something a little different about me. Um, my, uh, <laughs> in terms of the promotional materials that were used to advertise for, for this lecture, my hair was a lot shorter. I was also a lot younger in that particular photo. Um, but I'm, I'm currently sort of living in, in the COVID life of being, being my, a rock star, you know, so David Grohl here trying to match his, his haircut, um, one of my childhood passions. But I'm really not here to talk about my hair. I'm hoping it's not gonna be too distracting to you today. Um, but I'm really here to talk about my big passion, and that is biodiversity. Uh, biodiversity is the variation of all the different um, levels of life um, uh, that entails all levels of biological organization. So everything from the variation on the genetic makeup of organisms to variation in populations and species, um, even to the variation in, in Earth's ecosystems over space and time. And, and I would argue that everyone uh, should take a vested interest in understanding and appreciating uh, biodiversity because um, we directly benefit from biodiversity. And in fact, we could not survive without biodiversity. Uh, we rely on biodiversity for a number of things, including providing adequate nutrition for ourselves and the discovery of life-saving and life-extending uh, medications. Uh, biodiversity is, is beautiful, provides sort of boundless recreational opportunities, and biodiversity provides numerous services that we generally take for granted. Um, uh, services such as the generation of clean air and clean water, uh, soil aeration, erosion control, pollination, decomposition, and so many other absolutely critical and essential um, uh, uh, systems that are required for maintaining our high standard of living. Um, but a key challenge to really understanding this vast amount of biodiversity is, is that we actually don't know very much about it. Uh, for instance, you know, consider the diversity um, of animals, um, here defined as the number of species that are sort of known to science compared between invertebrates and vertebrate animals. So even a, a cursory sort of glance at this bar graph right here indicates that there are far more invertebrates, about 90% of animal diversity are invertebrates compared to just a small percentage of vertebrates. Yet, strikingly, when we, when we look at the number of described species um, compared to the estimated number of undescribed species that belong to these various groups, it's very glaring. It jumps out very quickly um, that a lot of invertebrate groups, here I have defined as just a couple you know, arachnids and insects, um, what we can see is that there's a huge disparity between the number of uh, described species and undescribed species. Um, and when we look at vertebrates, um, vertebrates are comparatively relatively, um, they're, they're fairly well known. So this disparity is, is particularly glaring right now, largely because we're experiencing uh, an, a really critical extinction crisis. Um, most biologists agree that we're amidst a crisis of unrivaled and sort of epic proportions and an extinction crisis that is largely due to the destructive nature of humans. Uh, the fossil record, if we extend that back some half a billion years when animals be, uh, began appearing on Earth, um, we, we understand that there's been five major extinction events that have occurred over this timeline. Um, most of these are what we would consider to be sort of ethically neutral. Uh, these were due to various types of, of events, uh, the most recent, of course, being a large asteroid that had struck the Earth and wiped out the dinosaurs. But of course, um, currently, the extinction rate is about a thousand times greater than that of sort of the background extinction rate. And that seems to be tied, uh, of course, to, to human activity. And so it's really Im imperative that, particularly for these unrepresented groups, invertebrates in particular, 
that biologists begin to study and, and sort of understand this, this, this forgotten group because it's really difficult to know, um, you know what you've lost if you've never known that it existed in the first place. And so this is where my story kind of begins in terms of my interests. I've always been passionate about biodiversity and in particular, I've been really passionate about arachnids. Um, so these are the animals that I absolutely adore. Um, I, I've long been captivated by these sort of eight-legged wonders, as I tend to call them, for as long as I can remember. And, and in fact, uh, my, my very first memory is, you know, I vividly recall as a three-year-old boy watching a jumping spider pounce on a fly and, and devour it. And so my, my enthusiasm and my passion for studying these animals and, and observing these animals um, has only grown with time. Um, so it, it, it always strikes me that, uh, you know, the, the majority of people find these animals sort of loathsome, terrifying, and perhaps for good reason. Um, so I suppose, you know, these really terrible sort of uh, Hollywood B-horror films like this 1955 classic Tarantula, these probably don't help so much in, in terms of people's understanding of, of these animals. And of course, there's the nice uh, flyer there advertising this 100-foot high crawling terror. Um, you know, I also suppose that, you know, some of you might recall the 1981 classic Clash of the Titans, uh, where Perseus, who's the son of Zeus, um, fights off giant scorpions that bubbled up from, from the blood of, of Calibus. Um, so, you know, the, these, the, you know, the media has hyped this up, but, but really these animals are really fascinating. And, and while it is true, some of these animals can get quite large. Um, some of the largest tarantulas here, we've got some, some you know, sort of fancy photographic trickery here showing you how big some of these spiders might appear. But this is a Goliath bird-eating tarantula from South America um, and running headlines like puppy-sized spiders, those sorts of things are, are, are always kind of tongue-in-cheek. But as you can see, that we do have sizable animals here. But when we think about tarantulas and scorpions, which are my specialty in particular, um, I tend to focus a little bit more on, on animals that are considerably smaller. So even though you probably think of tarantulas as being these incredibly large and grotesque and, and very terrifying types of animals, you know, some of them are actually quite small. This is an adult female tarantula collected from central Arizona that um, with its legs fully spread out is no larger than a quarter. Um, here's a tiny little scorpion, so far-fetched from Clash of the Titans, uh, that's barely the size of a dime. But, you know, and, and while headlines like this right here um, certainly don't continue to do these animals any sort of favors, um, you know, here we learned that spiders could theoretically eat every human being on Earth in one year. Mind-blowing. Um, but, you know, the point of this article sort of illustrates the magnitude of, of, of these animals' impact and their importance. So what the article actually says um, is that, you know, spiders are able to consume somewhere between 400 million and 800 million tons of prey, mostly insects, every single year. And that, in terms of biomass, that far exceeds that of, 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 of humans. So, you know, consider if spiders did not exist and um, if, if other animals didn't sort of take the role of these really important terrestrial predators, um, humans would be very quickly overrun by insects and a lot of other pests in, in very short order. Um, and of course, you know, when we think about tarantulas and scorpions or spiders and most arachnids in general, um, we tend to think of the, 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 the business end of these animals, the end that is capable of injecting pain and venom. But even research on venom of these animals has been very, very useful in terms of discover, uh, discovering new and novel types of, of medicines. Everything from um, tarantula venom inhibiting atrial fibrillation. Um, we've got potential anti-cancer therapies. We've got various types of venom components that are targeting uh, parts of nociceptors and reducing the amount of pain that people experience. So being, you know, particularly dealing with the opioid crisis and being able to develop um, uh, non-addictive painkillers. Um, and also even identifying new types of uh, sort of insecticides, sort of a, an ecological friendly or a green type of insecticide. All of these are different types of compounds that have been isolated from the venom of these animals. And, and now while my research itself, I'm not, I'm not curing cancer. Um, 
Uh, that's not my interest. But what my interest is is really sort of unraveling and understanding this diversity of tarantulas and scorpions in the United States. And in particular, the big project that I'm working on uh, right now, which probably had its origin, I would say, more than 20 years ago as I began uh, really starting to study tarantulas in more detail when I was a, an undergrad in college. Um, my big project right now is, is a field guide uh, to the tarantulas and scorpions of the United States. So there's over 30 species of tarantulas and, and well over 100 species of scorpions. And what I'm trying to do is document the diversity of all of these different arachnids, uh, but also their distributions and present that um, to the public, but also the scientific community to be a useful guide for identifying all these different animals. So this particular project is under contract um, with Princeton University Press right now with an anticipated sum, uh, and submission in a couple of years um, and hopefully released shortly thereafter. Um, but in terms of this project, um, you know, it involves a lot of field work, it involves a lot of photography, and uh, I'm really lucky because I have friends and colleagues who have been really instrumental in helping out with this project, and I just, I have to share some work um, that a friend of mine, uh, um, Mark Pennell, who's from the UK, who is an absolute amazing artist who's been designing some images that I'm going to be using in this field guide right here. So these are some time lapses of some illustrations of a tarantula and a scorpion from South Texas that he has uh, prepared for me that'll be really nice to, to include in this book. But as I said, one of the really cool things about my job is, you know, I, I've been my hobby and my job, they're, they're not separate from each other. And it's really amazing because I rarely feel like I have to go to work. And I love going out into the field and spending time um, playing around with critters. You're driving across the desert and you see tarantulas walking across the road or you see holes in the ground and you start putting sticks or blades of grass in there and seeing what might try to fight back and play tug of war with you. Um, this is a road cut up in um, southern New Mexico with a really beautiful uh, tarantula that I'd found a couple of years ago. Um, and of course, even looking for scorpions is really phenomenal. So you, some of you might be familiar with the idea that scorpions, um, what's really unique about them is that they have the ability to fluoresce under an ultraviolet light. So we can go out at night when these animals are most active, take these little UV lights, shine them, on the, on the animals, and this is what they end up looking like. So this is what we see when we're in the field with these black lights. And in some of the habitats that we, we look for, it's literally like looking at a constellation of, of, of stars, particularly in, in sand dune habitats and other habitats where the population densities of these animals are really high. And probably one of my favorite things about this particular hobby um, is that the animals that I really love also live in my favorite places in the world. Um, so the American Southwest, and so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about that. But one of my other hobbies that I'm really passionate about, um, that I'm happy to be able to do while I'm working um, and collecting these different animals, is I'm sort of a, I'm an amateur photographer. So I'm going to take you through sort of a, a little bit of a tour of some of the places that, that I visit and some of the photography that I do. So everything from taking images, panoramic images, for example, of the Superstition Mountains out near uh, Phoenix, Arizona, to going up into northern Arizona with us watching the sunrise on the north rim of the Grand Canyon. This is actually one of my favorite photos right here. And in fact, the previous photo is now hanging up in um, my dining room at the house as a, as a large sort of 90-inch canvas piece. Um, I spend a lot of time in the Big Bend region of Texas. These are the Chisos Mountains, the highway heading up into the Chisos Mountains to explore. Um, Death Valley, this is a brisky point right here. And of course, you know what they say about what goes on in Vegas. Well, I just captured it with my camera here. So, uh, so I spend a lot of time doing this type of, of work. And I love this because the best time to do photography is shortly after sunrise or right before sunset. And so you capture just this amazing light, and it's just a good way to sort of spend my time before it gets dark. But also some additional photography. Here I am at uh, 
the, the uh, Horseshoe Bend of the Colorado River up near Page, Arizona. I spend time doing landscape photography in Utah. This is Zion National Park, um, not too far off of the Watchman Trail, the, the Virgin River cutting through there. Here's another image of the uh, Zion National Park, the Virgin River. For those that might be familiar with the National Park, they um, there's a hike known as Angel's Landing. This, uh, that bridge over the, the river right there is the trail that leads up to the top of, of Angel's Landing, which is one of the most phenomenal hikes that you can absolutely do. It's very, very scary. So if you do do it, be prepared, watch some videos, and you might turn your back on that. Um, but also some additional uh, photography out here at Oregon Pipe National Park down in southern, on the, on the Arizona-Mexico border. This was in early April, a few years back, while a lot of the cactus began blooming. Um, but I also kind of skip around. I, I sometimes actually find water outside of the desert. So this is Kanara Creek, uh, which is also in Utah. Um, but what, again, one of my favorite things to do is, is, is spend time doing photography right before the sun goes down because the, there's nothing that can compare to a southwestern sunset. So this is an area in the Chiricahua Mountains in extreme southeastern uh, Arizona where the hues, the oranges, the, the, the pinks, um, uh, the yellows that just blow up the sky are just absolutely incredible. And we'll be revisiting this photo in just a little bit. Um, here I am in Catalina State Park. The sun has just set, um, capturing nice silhouette of a, the classic sort of iconic southwestern symbol, the saguaro cactus. Um, I'm here I am in Borrego Springs, California. We, we've got some uh, silhouette of a palm tree against uh, the really beautiful sunset here. Mojave Desert with the Joshua trees. Here's some more saguaro and organ pipe cactus. Uh, really beautiful, bright pink sky. I barely missed this photo. I had it framed in the wrong spot and the color changed so quickly because the clouds that are in the sky up here, um, not more than 30 seconds before I took this photo, they were all just absolutely bright pink, but it was not a good frame. But even after the sun goes down, this is where some of my favorite photography happens as well. So I spend a lot of time doing astrophotography, trying to capture um, the galactic center of the Milky Way. So this is in Oregon Pipe National Park as well, capturing uh, the Milky Way there. Uh, here I am in the Mojave National Preserve, capturing the galactic center of the Milky Way. And perhaps one of my favorite photos that I've ever taken is of the Superstition Mountains, which I talked about earlier, where I did about a 30 minute time lapse around midnight um, to capture this shot and to get some, some star trails. And you can kind of see the Milky Way behind it that's been sort of blurred. Uh, and as that was rotating through the sky, is able to capture that as well. So this is all great. And I absolutely love this. And I'm really excited um, to, to be able to get back out in the field very, very soon. Uh, begin my photography, because as you know, last year was, was very difficult for all of us, particularly for the type of work that I want to do, not being able to travel very much. But None of this really benefits me um, in any considerable way unless I'm able to share this. And my favorite thing about going into these areas particularly is being able to take our students, Millsap students, into the field uh, because they're just, uh, for a lot of them, they've never been west of the Mississippi River. And for those of you that may have traveled to the southwestern United States, it, it's, a, it's an, a completely different world. And so uh, I have a lot of students. Um, this is by, you know, it's not an exhaustive list. I'm sorry if anyone's watching and I'm not getting ready to give you a, a shout out right here. But going back even as far as, as May 2009, so it was after my first full year at Millsaps, I began taking students into the field. So I have Sloan Click right here, and this is Bernadette DeRussi. Uh, Sloan graduated in 2012. Bernadette, I think, graduated in 2010. Um, here we were somewhere near Pace in Arizona. You can see really big tarantulas on their hand that they, they had just collected. Um, and so just the, the excitement that they feel to be able to see these animals that they don't generally experience um, in this part of the United States uh, makes me even more excited to continue doing this. Uh, here I've got Jake Storms, Nate Davis, and Brennan Barnes. Uh, we're, I, I believe we're at Choya Gardens in, in Joshua Tree um, National Park right here. 
um, shortly after this photo was taken, we actually got into a Choya fight. And if you don't know what Choya cactus are, if you see all these Choya right here, um, it's a type of cactus where they basically drop significant parts of the vegetation. And you can walk around and it'll, they'll get stuck in your shoes and they'll penetrate your skin and you try to pull these things out and we've got, the, we've got these really, really big barbs and it pulls your skin, it makes you bleed, it hurts but uh, we just started throwing these things at each other and it was a good time. <laughs> so they, they were really good sports <laughs> about that. Um, here I've got uh, Dustin Gehrig and Harrison Olinger. We were spending some time in, in Guadalupe Mountains National Park on the New Mexico-Texas um, border. We were doing some work on, a, on another group of spiders that's really closely related to tarantulas. Um, on one of my summer classes, this is Sky Williams and Cheryl Cole, uh, where we had just collected a handful of tarantulas uh, north of Phoenix. Um, here's Matt Lippman, who's really, really excited about the big desert hairy scorpion that he had just collected just east of Phoenix. Um, we, he, he had a really good time on a couple of trips that he'd went on uh, with me. Um, and also, you know, I'll, I try to incorporate students into some of my landscape photography occasionally as well. This is Miranda Gopp and Kayla Pavlik. Uh, here we are on the Texas-Mexico border. Uh, you might be able to make out the, the Rio Grande River right here. Um, so everything to the left of that is Mexico, everything to the right is Texas, I'm trying to capture a good photo of them right before the sunset. Um, here is Keaton Dooley and Miranda again uh, on a trip where somewhere in West Texas, I think on the Pecos River Bridge. Uh, more recently, Ella Calhoun and Emma Yoakum, who is now a graduate student at the University of California at Davis, um, studying spiders. Who would have thought? Um, we're here, I think we're in Big Bend, maybe, or maybe in the Huachuca Mountains. Uh, I can't quite remember. I see some, looks like some oak forest behind us. I can't quite remember where this photo is taken. But of course, in, in addition to the research students who have a lot of these really fun experiences in the field, I also, every summer when, when possible, uh, I love to take classes out there where we load up a van, we load up all of our stuff, we load up a bunch of tents, and I take students out, and we wave that Millsaps flag quite proudly. So here's a group of students at Arches National Park in eastern Utah near the Colorado border. Um, here's, again, the Superstition Mountains. I can never get enough of going here. This was the last summer class that I actually taught. Um, and there's a lot of funny stories behind this photo that I don't have time to share right now, uh, but if any of them are watching, they know exactly what I'm talking about. But it also involves some Choya cactus. <laughs> um, and then, you know, here's another group photo from one of my favorite locations, which you might recall this photo right here, just a different time of the year. Um, in the Chiricahua Mountains, and it's this particular area where I'm going to spend most of the time talking to you today about my actual research. So I, I love sharing these experiences with my students, but we actually do work out there as well. So um, without further ado, let me introduce you to, to this area. So um, collectively, this area um, that I do most of my research in, and while I spend a lot of time throughout the entire southwestern United States, including Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, Nevada, Utah, uh, all of these areas, I, I tend to focus most of my efforts in a particular region um, that's a portion of this larger region indicated by red here known as the Madrine Pine Oak Woodlands Biodiversity Hotspot. Um, a biodiversity hotspot is an area that harbors an extreme amount of really high biodiversity, but it also is experiencing a lot of threats. Um, and so they are areas that are of conservation priority. Um, and in particular, I tend to focus much of my work in this general area in that extreme southeastern corner of Arizona and the adjacent Boot Heel region of New Mexico. And hopefully in the near future, we'll be able to spend a little bit of time working in this area of northern Sonora. But if we look at this area a little bit closer, um, this area that's demarcated by the red dotted line right here, this represents this area that we colloquially sort of refer to as the Madrian Sky Islands. Um, this area, as I had mentioned, is part of the Madrian uh, Pine Oak Woodland Biodiversity Hotspot. But this area is also really, really rich in its biodiversity because it is at the intersection of several major sort of 
um, biological provinces that all merge in the same location. So there are influences in the biota, so the plants, animals, and other organisms that um, make their, that, that reach sort of their southernmost extent uh, from the Rocky Mountains. Uh, we've also got a lot of species from the Sierra Madres down in Mexico, the main sort of backbone mountain chain down there that are making up sort of their, their northernmost distribution. But there's also a lot of heavy influences from the neotropics, um, hence the presence of these large columnar cacti such as saguaro and organ pipe. We've got influences from the Sonoran Desert to the west. Um, the Chihuahuan Desert and the Great Plains to the east. And so in this area, all of these different biogeographic sort of realms come together, and there's this big diversity melting pot, which makes this area one of the richest areas in the world in terms of its biodiversity, in terms of the number of species that are present in these areas. Um, it's one of the most famous birding areas for folks that are interested in birds. Um, here's just an absolutely stunning photo of a male elegant trogon, which is a, a photo that was taken by my friend uh, Michael Jacoby who uh, f found this just absolute stunning bird. So a lot of people flock to this area, southeastern Arizona, the Chiricahua Mountains in particular, to try to photograph uh, these birds. And this area is also highly notable because it's also one of the last remnants of, of, of jaguars. So jaguars do still exist in the United States. They used to have a much further distribution up north, uh, but because of hunting um, and other human encroachment, uh, jaguars have largely been pushed uh, south of the border, but there are the occasional uh, game cameras, uh, 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 trail cams that are capturing um, this particular male um, as he sort of makes his way through uh, various mountain ranges in the Chiricahuas and the Dos Cabezas. And occasionally we, we hear of sightings from some of these other mountain ranges as well. So this image right here is really giving you a, a more sort of um, you know, magnified view of what this area of Arizona looks like. And what I want to point out is that this section of Arizona is part of a larger sort of biogeographic province or geological area of the United States known as the Basin and Range. Um, physiographic province, whereby we have a series of these general sort of uh, north and south trending mountain ranges that are separated by north-south trending valleys. And what's really unique about this, um, this, this area, we refer to this as the Madrian Sky Islands. So interestingly, all these individual mountain ranges, they are isolated from each other, um, and, and I'll talk about this in a little more detail in a little bit, but this area serves as sort of a dispersal corridor for a variety of different organisms from the south that are moving up from the Sierra Madres, but also a dispersal corridor for animals that are moving south from the Rocky Mountains and the Colorado Plateau. So we also refer to this area as sort of it's a biogeographic filter um, whereby it permits certain organisms to kind of pass through, um, but it prevents others from doing that. But suppose, that, you know, so one of the most famous of the Sky Islands and probably the best studied Sky Island is that of the Santa Catalina Mountains, which are just on the northeast side uh, of Tucson. I've spent a, a considerable amount of time in this particular mountain range. And it really, when, when, when you drive up, there's a really nice highway that takes you all the way up to the top of the main mountain, Mount Lemon. Um, where you transverse from, from about 2,000, 2,500 feet in elevation all the way up to over 9,000 feet over the course of about 30 miles along this road. But it's really nice because there's a lot of beautiful vistas where you can look out across the valley and it really gives you an appreciation for, so, for, so for example, if I was looking from the Santa Catalina Mountains, I was looking at a neighboring range to the south, the Santa Rita's, this is what you would actually see. So you can imagine your feet being stamped down right here in the foreground in the Santa Catalina Mountains and looking across this large desert valley um, to this other mountain range um, that is you know, numerous kilometers south of the area. But the, 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 the term Sky Island essentially is, is you know, it, it's a kind of a unique term in that when you think of an island, you generally think of some type of a, a isolated landmass that's completely surrounded by water. And for animals that live on the land, they're isolated from other land masses because that, that water creates a barrier. Well, in the same vein as that, these sky islands are also islands, uh, but they're, 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 they're montane islands that are separated by seas 
of, of desert. And to get a little better indication of this, you can see the Santa Catalina Mountains in the background here with the desert in the foreground. And so this creates a really unique landscape for understanding the diversity and evolution of organisms that exist in this area. Now, in particular, uh, one of the things that's really fascinating about uh, the, these mountain ranges, all of these individual isolated mountain ranges, um, there's this very distinct, what we refer to as biome stacking. So biomes, you can think of them as just being different um, types of vegetation that have different adaptations to uh, the local climate, so temperature and moisture regimes. And so as you go higher in elevation, moisture and temp so moisture increases and temperature decreases, and it results in this very distinct banding of these different vegetation zones. Um, and in particular, when we talk about the Madrian Sky Islands, um, the term Madrian really has the influence from the Sierra Madres, which are really well known for their oak woodlands and pine oak woodland habitat. But again, coming back to this concept of a sky island, Organisms that are adapted, you know, animals in particular that might be adapted to living in these cool, moist environments in one mountain range, they are isolated from other mountain ranges. And so this, this area in general, the Madrian Sky Islands in particular, they're known as being sort of these significant generators of diversity because there's all of these really cool and interesting evolutionary mechanisms that are at work. So first of all, because of that biome stacking, we have organisms that could potentially be adapted to these different climatic regimes along the, an elevation gradient in individual mountains. So we can get the generation of novel diversity just within a single mountain range um, due to this divergent natural selection along these habitat gradients. So that's one mechanism by which we might be able to generate a, a lot of diversity and explains one of the reasons why we see so much diversity in this reason. But similarly, because these islands, these, these sort of islands of vegetation which are separated from each other by desert, um, because they're isolated, that also provides a very rich um, sort of foundation for generating additional speciation and diversity through um, just divergence between the actual sky islands themselves. So this area, again, um, being really, really important evolutionarily um, and, and from a, a diversity standpoint because of the number of different mechanisms that are in place. And so not unexpectedly, we find a lot of different organisms, including our arachnids, um, in these areas. But one of the reasons that I'm really interested in this area, so again, as I had mentioned, um, the, the Sky Islands are, are part of this larger biodiversity hotspot, the Madrine pine oak woodlands that extend way down into Mexico. But one of the issues that we're facing right now is that we're, we, we, we do know that climate change is happening. And in particular, climate change is really, really impacting these sky island habitats. And I wanna, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about some data that actually demonstrates how um, climate change has been impacting this area. So this is, these are not studies that I've conducted, but it's sort of a brief review of some studies that have been done in the area. Uh, I first want to draw your attention to a study that was published in 2013 uh, by Richard Bresca and, and colleagues. And what they had done is that in, in the early 1950s, um, a researcher had gone out and, and essentially measured these different vegetation zones, trying to understand the, the, the vertical distribution of various types of plant species that are predominantly found in these montane environments. Well, just 50 years later, um, Bruska and, and, and colleagues went out there and they basically repeated this study to see whether or not the vegetation in these areas had, had shifted to any significant degree. And without going into a lot of detail here, what I want to orient you to, or, or to uh, so that you can look at, is that we've got these white bars and we've got these black bars. Um, these black bars right here represent um, the, 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 the limits of elevation, um, distribution limits of, of various uh, plant species that were identified in this 2013 study, whereas the white bands, rep or the white bars represent the distribution of these different plant species in the 1960s. And 
what you can see is that those bars, they don't perfectly overlap with each other. And what that suggests for a variety of reasons is that these vegetation zones are shifting and they have shifted in just over the course of the last half century. Um, the shifts are not universal in that they're not all behaving in the same manner, but the point being is that the, the, the American Southwest has be, uh, become hotter and drier over the last 50 years, and the consequences of that climate change, much of which we scientists would agree is due to um, human causes, uh, is causing these various vegetation zones to shift. Now, for animals that live in these vegetation zones, they have to be able to basically, if they're unable to adapt to the new climate conditions, it probably makes a lot of sense for them to follow these vegetation zones. And we've actually demonstrated this in a previous, in a study that was conducted um, just last year. So uh, my friend, uh, Matt Graham at um, Eastern uh, Connecticut State University, um, and other colleagues and I, we, we looked at this montane tarantula, not one from the Madrian Sky Islands, but one from not too far nearby. Um, and what we basically found was that based on a genetic analysis and based on some species distribution models where we were able to look at what the predicted distribution of these animals might have been as far back as the last sort of glacial cycle, um, these different colors down here, what they represent is a probability of, uh, for the pre you know, what's the likelihood that the habitat would have been suitable for these spiders during a particular time. So during the late glacial uh, period, you know, 11 to 20,000 years ago, when the climate was considerably wetter and cooler in, in this area of the Southwest, what we can see is that the distribution, the, the, the amount of suitable habitat for these particular uh, spiders was, was much reduced. Now, these little purple stars right here represent actually where the animals are currently found. And when we do distribution models based on their current distribution, what we see is that those two distributions are very, very different. So what this data indicate indicated to us was that these spiders were probably contracted uh, in, a, in a fairly small swath of habitat, relatively small swath of habitat located along sort of the Mogollon Rim area of central Arizona. And then once the climate began to warm um, and, and dry out a little bit, the, habit, the, the suitable habitat began to expand and the spiders followed suit. And we have the genetic data that also confirms that these animals probably went through a genetic bottleneck, which is uh, a nice molecular sort of marker or, or indication that the spiders may have done that. So we do know that spiders, tarantulas in particular, they will respond to potential movement of, of these vegetation zones. But one of the things that we run into in the Sky Islands is that when you're already a montane animal, if the weather begin or the climate begins to warm, you don't have the ability to move downward. You can only move up as the vegetation zones begin to move up. And what other research has been showing in this area is that the distributions of the Madrian Skyland species, various types of species that are found um, in these habitats, they're expected to continue shifting higher. So based on various um, carbon dioxide emission levels, projected carbon dioxide emission levels. Um, what we can see in this graph right here, so these different numbers are just these different yeah, greenhouse gas emission scenarios. Um, here we've got the current distribution of this particular pine species that is often found in the, uh, the Madrian Sky Islands. And based on some, some distribution models, all of these different scenarios basically agree that the montane habitat, the, the elevation level for a lot of these different species, so I'm only showing you data for one of these pine trees, but for a lot of other species, it looks like there's going to be a gradual shift um, over the next 50 years. In addition to that, um, climate change models predict that there's also going to be significant loss of montane habitat in the Madrid Sky Island. So not only are these vegetation belts going up the mountains, 
but the amount of available montane habitat is also shrinking. And so this is really problematic uh, for this area because again, the organisms that are, the other organisms, the animals, the spiders, the scorpions that are adapted to living under these conditions, they are at the whim, they're stuck on this island. And if there's no way for them to disperse to suitable habitat elsewhere, that's gonna be really problematic. Um, and so basically what, uh, you know, looking at present day distributions of available montane habitat versus what we're gonna expect to see just within even the next 30 years, um, these projections, these predictions show a pretty significant decrease in the amount of available habitat for these different organisms. And so because of this, it's really imperative that we get a better understanding fast of the diversity of the organisms that live in these areas. Now, I also, I wanna quickly uh, give a shout out to a couple of, of students who've graduated recently, um, Emma Yoakum and Lillian Lee Broussard, uh, who both did honors projects on a scorpion that was found in one of these sky islands. Um, where we were sort of addressing some of these issues in terms of assessing the diversity. Um, but I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the Scorpion Project in particular because the biggest sort of push of my research, particularly right now, is trying to understand the, di the diversity of tarantulas that come from this particular region as well. So prior to about 2015 or 2014, um, the diversity of tarantulas in, in the United States was really, really poorly known. Um, the taxonomy of the group was really poorly known. Um, they're very difficult to tell apart morphologically. So tarantulas, they're, they're, they're largely burrowing animals and they have this sort of conserved morphology. Uh, so it's very difficult to find morphological or anatomical features that can distinguish them from each other. Um, a lot of these subtle differences that we might even see in these three spiders right here are, you know, it's probably just, you know, just simple variation. And in particular, um, tarantulas from these mountain ranges were, were not known at all. We knew of spiders, but there had never been a tarantula described and named and actually formally named uh, to science from these sky islands. So prior to about you know, 2015 or so, um, after extensive field work from research that, uh, and field work that I had done um, over the last, you know, the previous decade or so, we had finally been able to find these tarantulas um, in these different montane environments. And these yellow circles right here indicate the different mountain ranges where we had seen these particular spiders. Again, prior to this, we knew absolutely nothing about them. We didn't know their names because they didn't have any. Um, we knew that they were different from other tarantulas in the surrounding desert, but we didn't know anything about them. So uh, uh, an honor student, Alexis Geis, now Alexis Albin, um, she and I spent some time working on these spiders. So we sampled spiders from these different mountain ranges and we sequenced up their DNA, we assessed their morphology, and long story short, a publication that was generated from this honors project basically found that all of these mountain ranges um, these isolated mountain ranges were genetically distinct from each other, but they were all closely related to each other. So again, I don't wanna go through a lot of the details here. This little tree right here just represents sort of the genetic or the phylogenetic relationships of these different populations. Um, the colors match up with the, the colored dots on, on the screen right here. But basically the takeaway point is that all of these populations, all of these mountain ranges were genetically distinct from each other, but they were closely related. So that suggests that there's a common history between them, but the fact that each of the mountain ranges was genetically distinct sort of provided the first bit of evidence that perhaps each of these mountain ranges also represents a brand new species. But through a, a series of additional analyses from these five different mountain ranges, um, we basically concluded uh, from that that there was probably three species that belong to those five different mountain ranges, um, and all of them were brand new to science. Well, a year later, um, after numerous attempts in the Chiricahua Mountains, again, this mountain range in southeastern Arizona, um, 
we finally found one of these Sky Island tarantulas there as well. It took 20, 30 attempts to go to this mountain range, and we finally, um, my, my friend Chris Hamilton and I, we finally had, got access to a male specimen that a woman had collected for us, and we brought it back to the lab, we measured it, we sequenced it, and ultimately what we determined is that now from these six different mountain ranges here, we actually ended up recognizing four brand new species, which we ended up naming in, in a very significant uh, monograph on the tarantula genus Aphona palma um, in the United States. So we recognize these four different species right here. So we had Aphonopelma catalina from the Catalina Mountains um, uh, near Tucson. We have this species Aphonopelma madera, which was a little more widespread in a couple of the other mountain ranges, Aphonopelma palencio, which was found in the palencio mountains and nearby valleys, and then finally Aphonopelma chiricahua. So four new species um, that we had described. But since that time, since that 2016 paper, uh, Chris Hamilton and I, we've been spending a lot of time, including a lot of our friends and colleagues in the area, particularly friends that live in the area, have spent a considerable amount of time searching these other unsampled mountain ranges. So we've been starting to fill in some of these sampling gaps such that we now have spiders from all of these mountain ranges. But also, what I want to draw your attention back to is this Chir the Chiricahua Mountains. So we had previously just found and discovered um, this, this other species that we just named. But now, uh, so you recall that, that image right there uh, to kind of reorient yourself to where we're at. Um, in the uh, fall of 2018, um, during my sabbatical, I went back out there and spent some time with my friend, uh, Michael Jacoby, and I was, I was in the field for nearly a month. I was ready to get home. I was really tired, um, kind of grumpy. We had spent some time in the mountain range trying to find more of these spiders, uh, of this Aphonopelma chiricahua spiders, having a lot of difficulty. We found a couple of males. We tried to find females, had a hard time. Um, I was ready to, to come home, and so we made the decision uh, the day before, or I think it was, I was going to be leaving the afternoon or something, uh, but we made the decision to go for a hike. And we went for a hike way high up in the mountains, um, just to sort of, sort of say goodbye to the mountains until I was able to come back. And what we discovered was something pretty spectacular. Um, so at close to an elevation of between seven and 8,000 feet, uh, my friend Mike found a burrow in the ground, and uh, it looked like a, a sort of a classic tarantula burrow, but we were unsure uh, what it was. We poured some water down it, and eventually this little spider come running out, and here I am looking for this female of this spider, Aphonopelma chiricahua, trying to find this, this uh, species to photograph for the book project, and we find this animal instead, um, and this is what that spider looks like. Um, when I took a good photo of her. Um, and I didn't know what to think of this animal. So what you can't hear is when that video played, you actually hear me going, wow, this spider is really pretty. It's really beautiful. I don't know what this thing is. Um, and ultimately, what we determined is I, I thought it was a female of that other species that lived um, in that same mountain range. Um, and here's a male that we had found earlier in the day as well. But after looking at it morphologically, it looked different. But again, they're really difficult to tell apart from each other. But after getting it back to the lab, sequencing up some DNA, not really knowing what to expect, um, what we found was that populations, all these individuals of this unique little form, this unique little tarantula that we found in this mountain range, they were distinct. Um, they're genetically distinct from the species that we, the only species that we thought existed in that mountain range in terms of the Sky Island group, uh, but it is a new species that uh, my friend Chris and I have in preparation. Um, it's been a long time in the making. We're trying to get it described. Um, there's an individual who knows that it's being named after them, and we're trying to get it done, but it's, there's been a lot of other work. But it's really cool because we've spent a lot of time, and we're discovering new species, and there's still so much more um, to be discovered from these areas. And so, of course, you look at this map, and there's so many other just sampling gaps, other mountain ranges that we need to spend time looking at in New Mexico, northern Mexico, um, other mountain ranges in Arizona that we need to check out. And then when you look even more deeper into Mexico, you can see there's even more. Um, but you'll actually notice that I do have a yellow circle uh, down in, in just off the 
northwestern portion of the Sierra Madres. And this yellow circle actually represents another new species that um, um, I didn't find it. It was given to me by some researchers that were spending some time in the Sky Islands in Mexico. But we found that it's, we determined that it was a new species and that was described a couple of years ago. Um, so just again, indicating that this area is incredibly rich in terms of its uh, biodiversity. So where do we go now? So I still have a good bit of research that I want to do in this area. So in addition to trying to fill in these sampling gaps, and we do have a lot of um, unpublished sort of preliminary genetic data that uh, my friend Chris has generated. I'm not sharing that data today, uh, but we do have a lot of data that indicates that some of these other mountain ranges probably also harbor unique species that need to be named and described. And we just, we suspect that this group is incredibly diverse. But one of the big questions that I ultimately have is knowing that we've got these populations found on these different mountain ranges is the, the big sort of scientific question that I have. Uh, is trying to understand how did these particular species, the Madrian Sky Island biota, how did they become isolated on these different mountain ranges? It's clear that there is an affinity, there's a relationship between these, they're each other's closest relatives, they're not closely related to the tarantulas that are down in the desert in the valley. So how was it that they actually became isolated? So that's one of the big questions that we're gonna be tackling next. Um, a couple of hypotheses that we need to test is sort of understanding, well, number one, perhaps the original population was distributed in numerous mountain ranges, so the green would indicate sort of suitable habitat, but then over time due to climate change, um, these suitable habitat sort of migrates upward in elevation. And so if the spiders are tracking that habitat, they can become isolated in that manner. But also there could be another situation which has been observed in, in, a, in a group of scorpions from this region is that perhaps the original populations were more sort of narrowly distributed when, uh, so this area is very geologically active. Um, these, uh, the, the Western United States has been basically extending uh, for 15 million plus years, if not longer, and that's what's, been, that's what's caused the formation of this basin and range physiographic province. So perhaps the original populations could have been already restricted at these higher elevations, but then when the mountains themselves were pulled apart, perhaps that's one way that they became isolated. So these are two different hypotheses that make very different predictions in terms of what we might expect um, the data to look like. So that's one of the big areas of research that I'm going uh, towards next, and hopefully this is an opportunity that students can get involved as well. So just to quickly wrap this up in terms of you know my conclusions. Um, so first of all, you know arachnids they're, they're not scary. They're actually quite fantastic animals, um, and I have seen that a lot of my students in particular they they take my um, terrestrial arthropod biology course. They come in very skeptical, very nervous. By the end of the class, they're actually handling these animals, grabbing them with their hands uh, very nonchalantly. It's, it's amazing. Um, the American Southwest is incredibly photogenic and is no doubt the best place on Earth. Uh, Millsap students are incredibly fun and talented. I love taking them into the field. I'm looking forward to having, hopefully, the opportunity to do that um, this summer. Uh, again, in terms of the research end of things, the Madrian Sky Island tarantulas, they're incredibly diverse. We're continuing to discover new species, very, very complex evolutionary history that we're excited about. And of course, um, the human-induced sort of climate change poses uh, a significant threat to this area, which is, gives us even more reason to spend time in these areas trying to document this diversity. Because again, we don't know uh, what you've lost if you don't know something exists. So with that, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, we're, we're not going to have time for sort of a question and answer session, but if for anyone who's watching who's interested in sending questions, um, feel free to reach out to me uh, at brent.hendrickson at mailsaps.edu. Um, you can also go to Instagram. There's my, my tag there uh, to see where my photographs. The, over the next couple of months, that site is going to become much more active as I'm able to go out and travel a little bit. And with that, I would like to thank you all for watching tonight and attending the lecture. And with that, um, have a good evening. Thank you.